<laughs> now we got to make sure it's on. They're, they're good. Just a quick audio check. Are you guys able to hear me? Awesome. Thanks. Great. So our next speaker is Swapnil, and he's going to be talking about how to defend our Android devices from malware. Awesome. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Swapnil Deshmukh. Uh, I'm here to talk about packing your Android. Uh, what we would be discussing about would be how to unharden the hardened applications that are already out there from a malware standpoint itself. So the applications are normally hardened using uh, the techniques called as obfuscations or uh, packers or protector itself. And we'll see without even rooting your devices itself, how can you extract information from there? Uh, before we start with our presentation itself, uh, there is a quick housekeeping stuff that I just want to run by you guys. Uh, the first one is that whatever we would be seeing in this particular presentation itself, uh, the presentation, the research that led me to this particular presentation itself, uh, and the samples and the demo itself is already a part of a GitHub. Uh, so feel free to check it out. Uh, if you have any questions itself, uh, you can certainly reach out to me and I can help you out in any form I could. Uh, the second one is a disclaimer. So this is uh, what my company has asked me to state out. Um, the views and opinions that are exp uh, expressed in this particular presentation itself is purely mine as an individual researcher itself. Uh, and I would really appreciate if we don't tag it to the company that I'm currently working or working on or have worked in the past. So now that we have it out of the door itself, uh, a quick who am I? Um, I'm a co-author of uh, Hackers Exposed series. The latest one that we have is Mobile Hacking itself that got published in 2014. Uh, the second one is I'm currently leading a security team for emerging technology, tech technology itself for a fintech company, uh, a company that you regularly use for payment uh, itself. Another one is I'm a malware researcher as well. Uh, we look at uh, different malwares that are already out there, either in Google Play Stores or our trusted Play Stores itself, uh, identify them, report it back to the Google itself so that they can take that application out. Uh, a few places where you can reach out to me, uh, the Twitter handle is up there. Um, another project that I have started uh, is an, a malware framework itself. It analyzes, uh, it's an abstraction of all the different malwares that we can see from an endpoint standpoint itself. Um, at this given point itself, the focus area is very much towards uh, the Android and the IoT side of things. But gradually, we are going to create this framework across for all the different endpoints that we can think of. Uh, this, the code itself is currently in first phase, uh, where uh, it will just do a discovery of all the different packers or protectors or obfuscators that are out there. Uh, in the phase two itself, it will remove all the uh, all the redundancies, all the all the hardened code itself, to give you a human readable code, so that we can understand what a malicious author is trying to do at any given point. Uh, there is a live instance of this application that is running as well, and that would be in the malware repository. So, so now, uh, so now that we have a level set around what I have done so far, um, we as a security evangelist as well, why is it important for us to understand? Uh, what, what uh, Android malware is all about and how is it impacting us. So these are the few news clippings that I have gathered uh, in past month or so that basically talks about the magnitude of uh, mobile malware itself and how it's impacting us. And it doesn't have an audio. It's basically talking about millions and millions of devices that have been impacted at this given point itself. Um, this is about uh, a malware that got released out in 2017. Uh, recently called Humming Bad. Uh, it was collecting a lot of information from a user standpoint itself and sending it back to a command and center. Uh, the third one is where they're stating out that it's impacting 21 million users itself. And there was a handful of applications that they found in Google Play Store itself uh, that was impacting users. So uh, the, the takeaway from these presentations it's, or from this news clippings itself is that uh, there are lots of uh, malware authors that are impacting our trusted Play Stores itself, your Google Play Stores or any third-party Play Stores that you're trusting at this given point itself. They have already infiltrated in there as well. Uh, on top of it, uh, it's all impacting like 20, 21 million odd, odd users. So considering the U.S. population itself, it's one in every 11 people who would be impacted with malware. So that's a very big surface area itself. Um, the third is... 
that there was a SOPOS report that came out with regards to uh, the sample growth of an uh, malware at any given point, and they are expecting, uh, they are predicting a 31 percent year-on-year growth of malware genomes itself. That's a very, very big percentage, right? Uh, we we right now have a sample of close to 230 odd genomes, um, so a 30 percent increase of that. Uh, is close to 300, uh, 300 malware genomes in 2018. So that's a huge uh, malware that would be released out. Uh, they even uh, state out that one in three applications that was released in 2017. So this particular year itself uh, has some or the other malware genome itself. So it's uh, one in the three applications that you guys or we have uh, installed in 2017 itself may be impacted with malware genome. So it becomes very important for us as a security uh, personnel itself to understand what that malware is trying to do uh, and how we can identify those. So uh, the main questions that we all would be having at this given point itself is there are tools out there, open source tools out there that will uh, analyze a lot of applications for us, right? So why exactly is it so difficult for us to analyze an hardened application? Uh, the main reason why uh, it's difficult for Google Play or for malicious authors itself uh, or antivirus solutions rather uh, or even for us to uh, evaluate the code is because it's heavily obfuscated. It's completely mangled code uh, so we are not able to form a human readable code after decompiling it so which makes it very difficult for us to read it. Um, along with that they also have something called as root detection checks. Uh, so uh, if you're running it in a compromised environment itself or if you're running it in a VM to do a memory dump, they will identify that um, and uh, they will basically deflate the malware uh, content itself because of which it's very difficult for someone to identify it. Uh, along with that, in 2016 itself, we saw uh, something called as anti-tampering being attached to malware authors itself. Uh, anti-tampering is basically creating a checksums of different code blocks that we have within uh, the, the bytecode. Uh, and those checksums would again have their own checksums itself and they create a pyramid of these checksums making it very, very difficult for uh, anyone to modify the code or even create a hook so that we can uh, put a logs around what, what a packer is doing or what a protector is doing at any given point. In 2017, there was, uh, there were some, there were few of the mal uh, malwares that we saw. Uh, that was encrypting SD card. So your SD card uh, information itself was completely encrypted and the information was hard coded within your uh, application stack itself. Uh, however, they were using something called as white box cryptography, which will obfuscate the keys that are obfuscating or encrypting your SD card. So if you do a decompilation of the entire code itself to identify where the, uh, where the passcodes are, it was very difficult for us because they create a secure world that will have an abstraction of a crypto library altogether. So uh, it was very, very difficult for us to identify what those keys are to decrypt the data. Uh, so that was a new trend that we saw in 2017. Uh, on top of it, a lot of uh, malware authors are already using something called as anti-emulation, um, which identifies that you're running uh, either a GDB or JDWB, for example, or you're running it uh, in Google Bouncers, for example, which uh, identif uh, which validates the application before it's been published in Google Play Store. Uh, and uh, it will either create a time box scenario in case of Google Bouncer because Google Bouncer only validates an application for five minutes. So uh, this malware content itself will deflate for five minutes uh, and once it's out in uh, Play Store itself, it will inflate after that. So which makes it very difficult for Google Bouncers to identify those code. Uh, or there are certain ones uh, that will see that you're hooking it either through a GDB or JDWP, which are, uh, which would basically create a, b a breakpoint for you, uh, and it will deflate the malware content itself, which will make it difficult for us to like identify it. So now we understand the challenges on why we are not able to identify it at this given point itself. Uh, there are few research papers that are already out there and there are a few over here and there are a few on the GitHub as well that states out on how you can get this data in a human readable format. Uh, however, the tools that they are released out are obsolete in many different ways because the packer has gone, uh, has grown over a period of time itself and the tool has stayed back in 2016 or 2015 itself making it difficult for us uh, to understand what they are trying to do. 
Uh, however, they are very good stepping stones to uh, stepping stone to understand how we can read through a packing uh, packer or how can, uh, how can we read into a protector file itself. So all all said and done, there are a few hardening techniques that I've been talking about for a while. Obfuscator is one of them. Uh, this is one of the easiest one to uh, bypass at this given point itself. Um, obfuscators are uh, either would, they will scramble your data, so uh, your class name, method names, or variable names would be mangled in some form. Uh, a very good example in case of Java, we have package called com dot b side philly 2017 for example. Then it will change that from that to com dot a. Uh, so it makes it difficult for us to understand what exactly that obfuscation technique is doing. Um, Along with that, they also have something called as control for obfuscation. So your if statements or try catch statements itself uh, would completely change um, to uh, to a switch statement with a lot of dead code been put in. Uh, so uh, as an ethical hacker, if you're doing a breakpoint around what these applications are doing at this given point itself, uh, it becomes very very difficult for us to track that. Uh, because then you have to go through a different call function itself that will call a different return function or a different stub and it returns a null value itself because it's a dead code, it's not doing anything at any given point. Uh, so it, that's why it becomes more challenging for us to read through the code when, when you have control for obfuscation. Java reflection uh, and string encryption both together makes it another uh, avenue for us to like, make it difficult, uh, make the code very difficult to read. What ideally they do is they encrypt the entire string and they put that in the file itself in uh, the Java bytecode. Uh, and on top of it, they use Java reflection, so they're calling class for name or uh, method for name, for example, um, with an uh, encrypted string. And you first have to decrypt that string in order to understand uh, what the next uh, action would be that they would take. Uh, so a few tools that we looked at, uh, this, is, this is a malware that was released out in May 2017. Uh, this this was using a tool called ProGuard, which comes out of the box uh, in case of Android itself. Uh, this particular tool, uh, the one in orange, or the one that is highlighted in orange itself, uh, is how you basically obfuscate a class name. Uh, but this uh, this was a ransomware. It will it will basically create a device lock for you, uh, and uh, you have to pay 0.6 bitcoins to them to, in order to get the lock code back. So um, when we decompile the application itself, the lock code was hard hard coded itself. So if you look at the one in the red, uh, the lock code was one zero zero eight. If you traverse through the method itself, what it is trying to do is it's setting a, a passcode, uh, and then it's calling the EMM services, the management services itself, to put a lock on the device. Uh, this lock can only be unlocked if you are setting the right password. Um, or uh, you can reset the password rather if you're you if you have the right password itself in place. So which makes it very difficult for uh, a normal user to unlock their device itself. So either they have to pay uh, pay the malicious content itself or the ransomware rather, um, or uh, they have to wipe the entire device itself so that they can use it from that point on. Uh, the second obfuscator uh, is actually a protector that is obfuscating the code. So. If, uh, this particular uh, protector is is called TZ malware. So this was uh, released in November 2017, so a month uh, ago, and this was uh, impacting a lot of uh, African market itself. So they basically uh, were connecting to a command and center itself from where they were pushing a lot of code back uh, on either an update on Google Play itself, which would uh, which would be a malicious Google Play, uh, and what they were doing was they were obfuscating. Uh, Using Java reflections itself. So if you look, there they were using cl uh, class dot for name with a uh, uh, for, with an encoding after that, uh, and they have a function called on create, and they had seven different instances with different arguments when passed over. So uh, in order for us to decrypt the data itself or decrypt the string, we had to traverse back through all the different seven uh, co uh, function calls that they had, uh, and after that, we were able to understand what. Uh, library are they calling at this given point itself? So um, after uh, after a day and a half of like reading through the code itself, we understood that they basically are calling uh, a function uh, with this particular method name itself. So they they were calling run, uh, and that run was basically loading the uh, loading the file itself. Uh, the third obfuscator that we looked at uh, was an SMS service. They were basically sending uh, SMS to a premium 
number itself with your geolocation. So they were basically tracking you uh, at any given point itself. Uh, they were using very strong string encryption uh, with uh, with the non-human readable code. So as you can see, this is the one that we got from a Java byte code. Uh, we were hardly able to understand what exactly it's trying to do itself. Uh, so we went through, uh, so there are two things that they were doing. They were calling an import function. So uh, if you look at the HHH thing, that was the first one that got called for every time around they were trying to decrypt the data. So that was our first entry point uh, to look at what exactly are they trying. Uh, and then there was a function call that was called with three arguments in place. They were sending uh, the strings, uh, and the two other two arguments were the characters itself. So that was the function call that they were calling. Uh, this function call, uh, the first argument and the third argument was uh, either anded or odd, um, and the number of times it would be and or uh, it, it will go through an or itself would be based on the second argument. The character would be converted into an int first. Um, so we looked at those, um, we created a Python script that will basically read through the entire Oxen code itself, understand what we are, what they are trying to do, uh, and get a human readable malware payload injection itself that they are trying to inject at any given point. So it makes it very easy for us to like understand what, what they are trying to do at this given point. Uh, the, after obfuscation itself, the second hardening technique that we have looked at is called Packer. Uh, Packer does a, a dynamic of code modification of, uh, of of the code itself. So there are two execution environments that has been supported by Android. Uh, one is the Dalvik and another one is Android Runtime itself. Uh, so Dalvik supports dynamic code loading at any given point. So uh, what, what most of the practice do is they have a native code and that native code would start uh, injecting new code back to, uh, uh, back to this, this stuff that they have created. And that stub would basically create the decrypted code to decrypt the real classes.txt. Um, and we'll look at a few examples as we go along. Uh, the second one that we looked at was in-file loading. So they modified the header bytes itself that would have the classes uh, file in the buffer itself. And they will pull that out from the buffer and uh, decrypt the data. So it was in plain sight itself uh, that they will try to hide it. Uh, so. Uh, under the hood, this is how Packer actually works. Uh, there are, uh, in an application file itself, there are two parts of it. There is a compiled manifest and there is a, uh, the source, compiled source itself. The, uh, the compiled manifest is called Android manifest.xml, uh, that gets invoked. Uh, that Android manifest itself has a complete map of how to call Java files and what native files to be, uh, uh, would be called as well. And the source has the actions and the views behind it and how, how it needs to be called. So uh, the main thing that we are evaluating when we are trying to unharden an application from a static perspective itself is the Android XML, uh, Android manifest.xml and the classes.dex. So uh, what a packet would do is it will basically modify uh, your manifest, Android manifest, so that uh, it basically first calls the stub uh, which is the loader classes dot dex, uh, and then once that uh, uh, stub has been called, once the stub has been opened itself, it will decrypt the classes dot dex that actually has to be executed, and uh, the buffer itself would be read in either in the memory itself or it can be done in file. So uh, the first one that we looked at was uh, released in October 2017. Uh, they were using a very a newish packer that we haven't looked at yet called jump j2. Uh, this, uh, this one was loading a file, a native file itself, and that native file was reading certain uh, header buffers. And that buffers would take that information from there, mangle that buffer a bit, and then create a classes.dex from it. So, uh, by looking at, by, uh, by looking at the code itself, by looking at uh, the assembly code of how the native uh, library is loading it, we created a Python script uh, that basically would uh, re-scramble this scrambled code that they have and pull that information from the header byte itself. So the one that has been, uh, so the ones that highlighted in red is the increase in the buffer size, uh, the header size itself. Uh, a classes.dex um, would have a header size of close to 112-ish or so bytes. Uh, in this case, they had a, uh, had a header size of like six figures. So that was a very good indicator that they are trying to hide something inside the, uh, the header, header bytes itself. 
So we pull that information out in a read buffer itself. After pulling that information out, uh, we uh, so the first uh, 1024 were the real classes .dex, and after that was the header files. So we took that entire header files, put it right in front of it, uh, and the later later 1024 was our classes .dex, right? So we stored that um, in a, in a text file, used text to jar to convert that file uh, into human readable code. Uh, and that's how we were able to pull uh, the classes.txt that is actually the malicious content itself. The second one uh, was another one that was released in 27, uh, November 2017. Uh, this particular one was a fake WhatsApp application. Uh, it would first uh, install a gaming application and after the gaming application has been installed, it will, it will call uh, command and center itself and pull a fake WhatsApp application from there and replace your WhatsApp application that you already have installed uh, and push it as an update for you. So uh, we talked about stubs. Uh, so if you look at the Android, sorry, application tag itself, uh, they have uh, an Android name called Android Support Multidex. That's the first one that gets called uh, for executing the loader file itself. Uh, so if, uh, it's security through up security. They just renamed it to something else. So after they make that particular call itself, uh, if you look at the screenshot below, uh, the one that is highlighted in red, uh, is where they're calling up the uh, the, uh, the stub along with the hash code itself. This hash code would identify um, that it, it is uh, this particular library that it has to call along with this arguments. This, uh, the arguments would be sent out to a load library called uh, second hand. This is a native uh, code that they had. Uh, this native code would first do a device integrity check to make sure that they're running in a, a real device and it's not in an emulated device itself. Uh, and the second thing that it will do is an application uh, integrity itself uh, to make sure that it's not being breached, you're not hooking into emulators itself. Once that's done, uh, they will take that hash code itself uh, and they will take a new file that has been stored in the device uh, into a read buffer itself and decrypt that classes.dex and store that in the memory. Now, uh, next, uh, next time, after us, uh, after making sure that the integrity ch uh, check has been successful, it will call the command and center and pull an APK file from there, uh, and install that on your device itself. Now, if, if that fails, uh, let's say if the, uh, the check itself fails, uh, then, uh, it will basically deflate this classes.dex from the memory itself and load a gaming application instead. So, uh, in order for us to analyze this further, what we did was we basically created a Python uh, script that would be released out as a second phase of uh, our engagement uh, that would basically use this as a ha hash code, go, uh, go, go and talk to a second-hand uh, native library itself. Considering that it's a universal binary, most of the APKs that we have looked at uh, are universal binaries itself. So we are talking to an x86 itself, get, pulling out that hash code from, uh, pulling out the classes.dex from there by using the hash code that was provided in the code itself. Uh, and we were able to pull out a classes.dex. Uh, once we have the classes.dex itself, you use uh, text to jar to just convert that file from there on. <coughs> the third in the line that we have is wiki. Uh, wiki was used for an adware. Uh, so this particular application itself would click ads on your behalf. Uh, this was loading two native files itself, um, and then it was loading the text file, the encrypted classes.dex files that we had. It was loading those. Um, and uh, when we inspected the Java files further, uh, they was trying, so they will decrypt this data and store this in files folder itself within your application directory. So uh, during the run run of an application, we just did an ADB backup to just pull that information out from there, uh, and then further analyze it uh, using the tools that we already know of. So the third in the list is the protector. So protector makes our life a lot harder, to be honest, uh, because it's a combination of both obfuscation uh, and packers. Uh, so Protector uh, basically would be uh, using a loading stub, a loader stub, but the information of how to load that stub itself would be obfuscated using uh, the string or control flow obfuscation that we already have seen in the past. 
Um, along with that, they will have uh, dead code injection in there as well, making it difficult for us uh, to read read the code. Uh, one such example that uh, we looked at was text protector. Uh, this text protector itself uh, was loading a stub, as you can see uh, through the application stack itself. Um, but along with loading the stub itself, the classes dot text was heavily uh, obfuscated at this given point itself. So it was very difficult for us to like backtrack it um, on what exactly are they trying to do. Uh, so we went through all the different seven classes of obfuscation and how they are trying to do the obfuscation itself, uh, removed the dead code, and after that, uh, the first thing that we came to know is it's call, calling another uh, Java class that will have the stub in place. Uh, so we got got that, so dexprotector.name was one of them. Uh, that gets invoked, invoked, so we went in there, we got the stub information, the hash code itself that they're using, uh, and that provided us with an avenue of how we can decompile the classes.txt. So uh, now that uh, we have looked into all the different obfuscation techniques itself, uh, there is a quick demo that I have. Uh, this demo So uh, this this demo is basically uh, the, uh, the repository that we have. So at this given point itself, we have 427 different genomes uh, that we have identified from a, uh, from an Android standpoint itself. They all have been published um, to uh, on our repository itself. So this information would basically give us uh, different types of payload and uh, payload injection that they're trying to do. Uh, and it will provide you with more details around from where you can find more information about it. Um, along with that, uh, we also provide an uh, avenue of us to uh, like upload an APK itself, to do a static analysis of that application um, that has been uploaded, the text file that has been uploaded, uh, to to further inspect what kind of a protector or what kind of a packer are they using. So an example of that. So this is an example of uh, one of the packers that uh, I lo uh, uploaded recently. So as you can see, it provided, provides me with the packer information uh, that we are using, and it also provides me with where uh, the application is getting injected within uh, the manifest file itself. So these are like the pointers towards how I can analyze this, uh, analyze this hardened application further. So. If, um, So now that we have seen uh, a quick demo of how the application actually works, how we can see an hardened application itself, and how we can retrieve the classes.txt, which is the Java bytecode itself that has the information, the malicious uh, payload itself, where can we go next? Uh, so we're already creating malware genomes, as, we, as you can see. Now the next step uh, within our process itself that would be launched uh, in January 2018 itself is to do a static analysis of this application. So now that we have text protector and we have the map, oh, sorry, uh, now that we have classes.dex and we have the manifest file itself, how can we marry both the things together itself to understand the entire call graph of it? Uh, and based on that, uh, understand what kind of a protector are we using or what kind of a packer are we using uh, and break that uh, to get a re human readable code itself so that we can analyze it further to identify what are the malwares that are already out there in uh, our trusted uh, app store itself. Uh, the second thing that we want to do is do a dynamic analysis of this application as well to further an, uh, analyze uh, what premium numbers, what information has been sent to this premium number itself. Uh, and that would be done by creating a lot of hooks within the application itself as we identify um, uh, statically what that application does. So this dynamic analysis would be done through um, packing, packing of an application. So that being said, uh, we are also looking at IoT, as I stated before. 
uh, this is one of uh, the malware that I'm researching at this given point itself that connects to uh, your light uh, and that information is being sent out uh, back to a command and center itself uh, in two forms in form of an MQTT format itself that has uh, information whether the light has been turned on or off um, or do you have any certain uh, home alarm that has been compromised and that information will be go uh, going back to a command and center itself. Along with that they also have an XMPP protocol that will send out your information um, with regards to your location or with regards to your SMS uh, services itself. So we are looking uh, in details with, uh, around that um, and this is a very good example of it because what they are trying to do at this given point itself is create an MQTT host and protocol. Uh, along with that the string 3 and string 4 that you are looking at is the username and password that they are sending on our be, uh, on behalf itself to uh, to attack us further with what information they can get. So that being said that's all that I have from a presentation standpoint itself. Uh, let me know if you have any questions with regards to this. Hey, thanks for the presentation. I had a question about the uh, the libraries that could be used for for creating something like this. Is it the libraries themselves that are, are the problem, like the, the the frameworks that people are using, or are they just um, or people actually knowingly creating these just to, to make exploits? Meaning, is it if, if it's just a a college student creating a regular app using a framework that has all of these exploits already built into it, or are they just creating it themselves? That's the first question. So there is a mix of both that I have seen so far. Uh, there are 30 odd standard ones that are out there uh, that does a packer or protection in a certain format itself. Um, however, in the recent time itself, like the outcry that we looked at or jump J2 that we looked at uh, in this particular presentation itself, those are homegrown. Those have been made by certain malicious uh, malware authors itself to further obfuscate the code in such a way that we cannot read it. So it's a mix of both at this given point. And the next question, with, I, I kind of saw a, a, a brief bit of the Poppy Seed app. Like, how, what is, what exactly does that do? Is it just looking at the manifest file and then following the class that that, that Java, or how, how can we look at all the, the details, or, or I guess? Um, True. So, in order for you out. to, in order for you to get the loader, the uh, loader stuff uh, installed, you first have to. It has to be the first one that gets called, uh, and the only reason that, uh, only way that you can do it is through the uh, the application tag itself. So when we are inspecting that further, uh, the first injection point would be application tax, and that's the reason why we, that's the first one that we are looking at. Thanks. Tom. Any other questions? Great. Another round of applause then for Swapner. <laughs> <laughs>